decided uh, what to sort of include in this, I had to sort of deal with the fact that our, our uh, group now works on two very similar but obviously dissimilar navigation systems. We work on moth orientation to, to pheromones, but we also work on mosquitoes. And mosquitoes have very different problems to solve and a lot of very interesting cues to use besides odors and odor plumes. So for today, I'm just going to concentrate on, on moths and the lessons that uh, we might learn. And in keeping with protocol, I changed the title of the slide slightly um, because there are two, two features to think about, one of which is finding the odor plume, and the other is navigating along it to its source. And it's really the finding the order plume is just as important that you do that well and you do it quickly as opposed to just being able to navigate to its source. So let me uh, also uh, reverse orders here in a way and thank many folks who have helped me through the years to uh, understand these processes and, and a lot of other things that we work on in our lab. Uh, particularly uh, for today's talk, uh, Pep Bao, who's at, uh, ca in Catalonia, uh, worked with me on, on modeling. Joe Elkington, who was my former colleague at Massachusetts, who worked uh, on plume dispersion and flight behavior. <clears throat> also, uh, John Merlis from England, who's an atmospheric uh, physicist in a sense, and, and has really uh, enabled me to understand a little bit about what goes on in the atmosphere. And then finally, Anjanar Mafranetto was a graduate student of mine several years ago, and we got into how the fine scale structures of plumes affects behavior. Now, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, uh, in moths, with about 140,000, maybe 150,000 species, uh, that they all use pheromones, and that almost all of them will use a female admitted pheromone to find. Uh, uh, for, for the male to find the female. So uh, it's thought that this is a process under a lot of selective pressure. Uh, Michael Greenfield called this a race to find the female because the first male there is very likely to be the one to mate. So you have to find the plume and you have to navigate efficiently. Much of what I've done has been with the gypsy moth. And uh, as, as David mentioned, uh, some of these insects have very plumose antennae, and this is almost like a basket that receives uh, the uh, odor plume. And uh, <clears throat> you can see the female is rather different, uh, whoops, in terms of its uh, visage here. Strangely enough, the male doesn't seem to make any use of the female's visual presence. And, Everything is odor guided in his location of the female. Now, I got interested in this while I was a chemical ecologist working, actually, as a postdoc in, in Wendell Roloff's laboratory in the early 70s, when John Kennedy, one of the, my estimation, is one of the leading uh, insect behaviorists, uh, started to sort of question the way a lot of people conceptualized how this process worked. And part of it is John was very fond of precise terms, and he really disliked the term attractive because it sort of implied that the chemical itself was inducing the actual response and navigation. And uh, <clears throat> so he, and he got into some very interesting uh, debates with uh, Harry Shorey, who was a colleague at, uh, not, uh, not of mine at the time, at Riverside, about whether or not insects were using the structure of the odor plume or wind and the presence of the odor to locate a source. And uh, along the way, uh, you, you need not to, there's, not, there's no quiz at the end of this. Uh, this is sort of like one of those DNA charts that you can't read. Uh, there are just a vast number of terms that have been concocted to try and just understand this process. And the problem with a lot of these terms is that they're not based on the, sometimes they're based on the body orientation, sometimes they're based on the stimulus. Uh, it's possible to avoid all of these terms and just describe the behavior and the stimulus if you, if you think you know what the stimulus is. Uh, and, uh, but I'm just gonna concentrate on a few terms here. 
Uh, taxis is, of course, when the body is oriented in some fashion uh, aligned with the stimulus. Chemotaxis is something that has been invoked a lot, that is using concentration gradients, perhaps, to find the source. Uh, we think this occurs very close to the source, but as I'll describe the plume later on, it doesn't seem to contain maybe the right kind of information to permit chemotaxis at a distance. A nemataxis means that uh, upwind orientation has been uh, initiated. Optimotor nemataxis refers to the way in which that information about the wind direction enables navigation. I'll come back to that one. Tropotaxis we're not going to talk about, but that's where you compare right and left inputs. That can occur very close to the source. There's, there is really no good evidence that that's occurring at some distance from the source for the same reason I'm going to talk about in a minute with the structure of the plume. And then finally, uh, thanks to uh, one of the organizers here at Massimo, we have a, a, a concept called infotaxis. And this, uh, this sort of avoids a lot of the difficulties in identifying in the term what the, what the actual stimulus or uh, information is. It just says that it uses what's available. It is not necessarily explicitly trying to replicate what the insect is doing. It might or it might not. So John Kennedy uh, had a very little ingenious wind tunnel. He, he did this in the late 1930s. He used the mosquito Aedes aegypti. He would breathe into this uh, wind tunnel producing carbon dioxide, of course, and the uh, female mosquito would fly upwind. But what he showed is that you could project, sorry, I'll get used to this eventually, uh, project a, a floor pattern on the bottom of the tunnel, and that that was how the insect was responding to movement. It was gauging its movement relative to what it could see below. And, uh, and so upwind heading, in this case, is simply gauged by the fact that the flow of the visual field is front to rear as you look down. And transverse image flow, in other words, if it's, you're not headed directly upwind, you also have some side slippage. We call that transverse image flow. So when that kicks in, an insect realizes it's not heading directly upwind, and it can correct its course toward due upwind. And therefore, to follow a plume, there is no need to monitor changes in odor concentration uh, or gradients, uh, although insects do generally assume a, a not always perfect straight upwind course, but there is some zigzagging as it moves along. And, and the reasons for that will become clearer uh, later on. So this is, a, this is a concept that is not intuitive to us because we're anchored on the ground. And when we feel the air coming toward us, we have a very instinctively know which way it's going by tactile sense. And, uh, but when you're immersed in the medium, it's a very, very different situation. And it's, very, it's hard to conceive of this uh, uh, as an armchair scientist. OK. Now here's sort of the overview of some of the things I'm going to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> So uh, this is uh, a hypothetical moth. And one of the important things that it needs to do is to have a ranging flight or a searching flight that enables it to contact the plume. And this needs to be timed uh, to match when the female is producing pheromone. Uh, and it also needs to be effective in the sense that, remember, that male is competing presumably with other males to find the female. When it encounters a plume of odor. It begins to turn upwind. Uh, there may be some zigzag movements. And if you notice here, this moth has managed to find its way out of the plume. How did that happen? Well, uh, besides having this turbulent diffusion process, the wind is changing direction. We're looking down on this plume, and it's changing direction. Uh, the best way I can offer an analogy of that is if you had, if I could have a nice hose of water here, turn it on, 
and spray it back and forth across the room, you would have this path that zigzag or that, that circuitous path. But the actual trajectory of the water would be pretty much in a straight line. So as this insect is coming up to this point here, where it sort of reaches a spot where this is due upwind, and it continue, it, now it's lost the plume. So what does it do? Uh, moths cast, that is they repetitively go back and forth without much upwind progress. And they have a sort of a giving up time, presumably. And if they don't contact the pheromone, they go back to ranging flight. Uh, as they approach the source, there may be much more straight upwind flight. And this is occurring because of the way in which the internal structure of the plume is changing. So here's a sort of a fake plume. This is a visual plume in a forest. And it, it gives you a sense of just how chaotic this plume actually is. So this is, this is what, this is not very far. This is over just a couple of meters, uh, fairly still air. And you can see all these wispy orders. Well, what happens is that turbulent diffusion, of course, tears the plume apart. But uh, there are also little pockets that persist of fairly high concentration. And these get carried many meters downwind. And this and partly explains why distance of communication can be fairly substantial. So besides that, what you see there, I did mention this notion of wind shift. And this has been actually one of the more interesting things that we've looked at. Uh, uh, it was occasioned by a paper uh, published in Nature by Charles David and, and uh, John Kennedy uh, a few years earlier. And it, it's supposed that the wind, in fact, is constantly shifting its direction. And that influences how the plume uh, is dispersed, the overall envelope. Now, well, here we are in a, in a forest. And the way in which we would follow these plumes, we'd sometimes use puffs of smoke. Uh, in this case, we're using a neutrally buoyant balloon. And you can follow this uh, for fairly long distances in the forest. And as you, we use very, very high tech methods as this plume or, or bubble was going through the forest, we'd have little bamboo stakes that we put in the ground that signify where it was in time. And then we would go back and measure it. And this is fairly typical of what we would see in the forest. Uh, this is the point of origin, dead center. And there is one trajectory uh, here that's um, not too bad from the viewpoint of straight lines. But most of them end up sort of being very circuitous. Here's a, here's a great one for a straight line. So you can see the problem that ensues when an insect is trying to fly upwind. And the plume is constantly changing its angle. It's, it's where it goes. Remember, this, this is only 15 meters here. And lest you think that that's sort of idiosyncratic to that forest, uh, John Brady uh, looked at the same problem. Uh, he was, in, uh, I guess, inspired or maybe thought we were wrong. Uh, to, and he looked at this in the savanna of Zimbabwe. And he found exactly the same thing. The patterns are just precisely the same. And that's a fairly open uh, uh, kind of plant. Uh, uh, area. So it seems to be uh, something that's fairly routine. Uh, there are cases where there are relatively long fetches, and that tends to occur more in open fields, places where you don't have obstructions and you don't have a canopy up high. <clears throat> so uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. This is a uh, and this, I guess, reflects the fact that when someone like a, an entomologist or a behaviorist gets involved in meteorology, that we really don't understand what we're doing. Because we had assumed uh, when we were actually trying to understand this whole process that if you look down on the way the plume is moving in nature, you would assume that this is what it was, that as it was snaking along, the upwind direction would follow the long axis of the plume. But in fact, this is what happens when the wind holds at a steady velocity. This is the analogy I gave you with the, uh, using a water hose. 
And you can see that in those cases, you, you end up going right out of the plume if you uh, head upwind. And if the wind changes velocity, then these can get bent around and make it even harder to find the source. So the way in which we looked at this experimentally in the forest was uh, to use gypsy moths. And what we would do is we would take uh, a rack of gypsy moths, 30 gypsy moths, and place them in stands here. And we would have a sort of a tree here, tree-like uh, stove pipes actually, with pheromone source here. And what we would want to understand is how far away could the plume be detected and how good a navigation system does a gypsy moth have for finding that odor source. So <clears throat> this is uh, an example here of, of, of uh, it's actually two panels. Here is the rack of gypsy moths, all set in here. And there's a, a, a fast talking undergraduate student here with a, a little microphone and a recorder indicating how quickly uh, the uh, actual wing fanning ensues. Because this particular moth wing fans for a, a little bit before it takes off, it raises its body temperature so that it can fly. So they're quiescent. Uh, they begin wing fanning. And when they wing fan, uh, they are let loose. And they're marked at each of these distances so that we know exactly uh, which rack they came from. And then down here where the pheromone is, uh, we have our trusty uh, moth catchers with a butterfly net. Remember, these are day flying moths, which, which the only way we could have ever done this is with a day flying moth. And they catch them here and record where they came from in the time. Uh, the only problem that you have with this is one that you might have imagined in, if you can see all these strings radiating out. So we have to guess or hope that we can figure out which way the wind is going to be blowing when we set this experiment up. Sometimes we set it up and we never figure out which way the wind is going to be blowing at the time. You can look up in the canopy, through the canopy, see the clouds going by, but in the forest, the winds may be coming from all directions. So it's, it's an interesting methodological problem. So how successful are we? Well, <clears throat> let's say uh, if you look at distance here, and you look at percent departing, which means that they started wing fanning, clearly they sense pheromone and they would take off, that it's fairly high even out to 80 meters. It only drops off somewhat at 120 meters. But quickly you begin to see that the percent arriving drops off. And we, we waited quite a time. And the transit time gets longer, uh, and, as does the minimum. Now. Uh, they could fly that 20 meters uh, in, in less than uh, well under a minute. Very, very, very fast flyers. So what this tells us is that the distance of detection of the plume is much, much farther than the mouth's ability to navigate. Why do we think that that navigation ability is impaired? It's because we think of the turbulent diffusion and the shifts in wind direction, which means that you're catching little packs of odor, filaments of odor, but you're not necessarily able to find. Uh, sure. What are the letters denoting? Oh, those are statistical significance. So if you have statistical significance here, that would mean that uh, these, these fall into the same bin at the 5% the level, and these are different. So, so it, you know, obviously, in order to interpret the, whether or not we have any, whether these are just random pieces of you know, bad information, we always subject things to statistical analysis. Sorry. Th thanks for asking. So in our view, uh, with the gypsy moth, uh, what limits the distance of communication uh, is not how much pheromone she admits and possibly not how low the threshold of response is, although clearly those are very important parameters. <clears throat> but the changes in wind direction and turbulence seem to be important. OK. Let's get back to the fine scale features of the plume. Uh, 
back in the forest, we used a system which is actually, oh, I think I might have misplaced that slide. It'll probably pop up in the wrong spot. Uh, we used an ion system to actually measure fine scale structure. Open field looks very different. There are two time scales here. This is one second, this is five second. And in the forest, what you see is that if the wind is blowing and it doesn't change direction, you have a very spiky, very intermittent signal. And then you have long periods when perhaps you have no signal at all. Uh, open field, uh, again, <coughs> slight changes in direction, you get this. So this is, these are moderate distances, like 10 meters away from the source. Uh, so in the wind tunnel, we can begin to understand and manipulate uh, these features. And we can use a stimulus generator, which we can set to uh, have little puffs of odor, which again you see represented here by uh, hydrochloric acid from uh, titanium tetrachloride that we use to sort of as a visual marker. And you can see that you can create very, very definitive puffs. Um, and we work with this particular insect here, another uh, simple little moth, very uh, simple pheromone communication system. <clears throat> and one of the things you can do is you can give it a, a stream of pheromone, it flies upwind, and then you can turn it off. What does it do? It begins to cast. And when that happens, uh, you see it right here, you're looking down at the path of the moth, wind is coming this way, now the moth is casting, and at some point here, uh, probably about 200 milliseconds before this actual turn, we give it a puff of odor, and then it shoots, acceleration shoots straight up wind, but it does not encounter another puff of odor, so it goes back to casting. The length of this is a little bit dependent or can be varied by the concentration of odor in the puff and how big that puff is, but you have that same uh, process. Now, the idea is that in this turbulent world where you have these puffs of odors, you're continually contacting these individual filaments. And if you contact them frequently enough, then you head upwind. So uh, we also, and I won't go into this, we've measured a lot of these features of plumes using a photoionization detector system. Uh, we also know that the antenna of at least uh, five moths that we've looked at are capable of resolving uh, these puffs up to 25 hertz. So at least at the peripheral level, we know that those can be easily perceived. And again, uh, looking at tracks, um, this I think is somewhat helpful. What you see here is that if you have a, a, the fastest track at 25 hertz, 17 hertz, it's pretty much straight up wind even at five hertz, it's not bad. However, if you look at the average track, uh, as a statistical way of computing which is the average uh, amongst the tracks, what you find is that you get a lot of zigzagging at five hertz, but as you start going to 10 hertz, it starts to straighten out. And so uh, this, this is, in fact, how we conceive this works. And you can analyze these tracks on video as we've done many, many different ways. Uh, you can decompose them, and this is in two dimensions. Uh, you have the vectors of wind speed and direction. And the important thing to realize here is that to, uh, <clears throat> to achieve a particular track here with this wind speed, the moth must actually head this way because it's being blown back. So we can calculate all of these. We now have good computer programs this used to be a very laborious hand done process frame by frame, but we now have uh, very good computer programs that uh, do this pretty much automatically and give you lovely Excel sheets with vast amounts of information. But in any case, again, here's what you see. You see that the ground speed accelerates when you get up to about 17 hertz of puffs per, uh, per second, and the track angle diminishes, meaning that it's going faster and it's heading straighter upwind. And is this a universal principle? This is with the Cadre. Tom Baker and his group looked at this with another moth uh, in another family, uh, a noctuid, and they found virtually the same uh, uh, 
response to this. So this appears to be somewhat of a, of a universal principle with moss, but in fact, uh, there are 140, 150,000 species. We've only looked at a couple, but I think it, given that these two lineages are more than 100 million years apart, uh, that's probably a pretty respectable uh, way to think of it. So now I'm going to launch into something about finding odor plumes very quickly. Uh, remember, it doesn't do you any good to have a race along the plume to find the female if you haven't found the plume. So uh, there are strategies that you might imagine. You might sort of have a random strategy. You might hit upwind, downwind, and crosswind. Uh, we always thought random would be best. Uh, but uh, some colleagues in the Netherlands uh, proposed a theoretical model that suggested upwind or maybe downwind would be better. And the reason they did that was based on this fact that the plume changes uh, its angle continually because of the shifting wind direction. And if it does it by more than 60 degrees, what you find is that the crosswind area is in fact longer than this area here. Now, there are a lot of other assumptions that are based in, in this, but they propose that that should be what moths do, or any insect for that matter. But uh, they uh, didn't maybe account for the fact that moths are pretty stupid in, in, in the sense that uh, they don't keep track of where they've been in space over a very long period of time and where they may or may not have encountered pheromones. So to make use of a model like this, uh, they would have to keep track of an awful lot of information. So we looked at this. Uh, actually, we looked at it with gypsy moth, and we made another experiment where we looked at it in an even more sophisticated way with this moth. And this moth uh, is another one of these that's ideal for this because the male does not have functional mouth parts. So the male, just like the male gypsy moth, has nothing to do but look for a calling female pheromone-emitting female. And it, yeah. And is, it, there, is there a sense of this memory that you just mentioned that you showed? Or, okay, can, can you put some numbers on that? Uh, a little bit with, with some of the casting. Well, we, we, for casting, we can. But for the rest of it, I'm not sure I know how to do it. Uh, maybe we can have a but chat about it. Park is what? I mean, Pardon? What, the, the memory in time, for example, you, you said they don't remember that. Much. Well, they, they, they may remember recent encounters, but they would also need to remember often where they were if they weren't using optomotor or nematech. What you say recent is what? Second, 10 seconds? 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 5 seconds. That would be my it's seat of the pants. We, we can chat more about that. Uh, so all flights are meant to be in search of the female. Uh, we did this in a this lovely uh, place in Acadia National Park where I will be in a week looking at this moth again. Uh, and there's a sonic anemometer here. Whoops. And uh, a video camera. And these are the kinds of tracks that we could see. Most of them are fairly straight. There are a few weird ones that you get where they change course. But we were able to get a fair number of these. And uh, I should maybe point out, let me go back and point out one other thing I think in here. This is a way in which we analyze directionality. It's called circular statistics. It's not circular reasoning. It's circular statistics. And this is actually the wind direction. This is a coastal bog. And so in the afternoon, the air comes in from the ocean into the bog. And that's why there's that preferred direction of airflow. And this arrow denotes the strength of statistical association. If it's a very weak arrow, or there's no arrow, that means there's no statistical value in the distribution. So quickly, what do we find? If we look at, if we analyze it vector by vector, meaning each 30th of a second, or we analyze the entire track, and we correct for wind always being at zero, you see a totally random distribution of trajectories, either moment by moment or over the entire trajectory, meaning that this moth has no particular sense of paying attention to direction of the wind. And you actually see some other things that you can pick out of this because the mean ground speed will vary uh, depending on whether it's going upwind uh, a little bit or downwind, but not so much because 
the moth, again, uses its optomotor reaction. It uses that to set its course. So it's looking down and picking up the same rate of visual film. So you don't see very much variation in this, even though there's some variation, quite a bit of wind. So uh, the flights are not aimed with respect to contemporaneous wind flow. Uh, we actually tried that and, and also found it true with gypsy moth. However, there's kind of a funny de facto arrangement here because when you go across wind, uh, you actually, there are two crosswind sectors, one up one, down, down one. So if it's randomly distributed in all four quadrants, you actually are spending more time going crosswind. So, so now I'm going to move into uh, the last area, uh, modeling. And uh, it's pretty difficult to do this in the field. Um, there have been a few cases where they've been able to put harmonic radar transmitters on moths and follow them for a bit. Uh, the precision of knowing exactly where that insect is in time and space is, is decent. It's sort of somewhere in this area here, maybe. Uh, but the problem, in part, is you don't know what it's experiencing in terms of its current wind flow. So there's a lot of things we can't yet do with uh, miniaturization of tracking systems. Uh, but we can sort of explore these uh, concepts in a virtual world. And uh, <clears throat> we then can sort of apply sensitivity testing to see what parameters affect the outcome. And uh, there we've been able to apply critical actual flight parameters for the gypsy moth, which we know an awful lot about now because we've been working on it for so long. So that's uh, <clears throat> um, where, where we sort of focus some of our work. And again, gypsy moth doesn't feed as an adult. We know from wind tunnel and video records flight speeds. We know how far away it can detect pheromone. I just showed you those data. And, and very importantly, we have a plume model now, a simulation plume model that my colleague Jay Farrell and John Merlis and uh, some others at, at UCR uh, developed that enable us to simulate the plume. It's, it's a model that gives you a, a, a sort of an instantaneous slice of odor density. It also has a wind uh, direction change built into it so you can set the parameters. And this model avail is available online. It's been cited several hundred times already and a lot of people have used it a bit in, in simulations. So our virtual world is a grid of traps uh, within a 100 meter uh, inner trap distance. And we release virtual moths in the center. And then we give them various strategies for either finding the plume uh, and the actual way in which they navigate along the plume is pretty, pretty straightforward. But we do have to sort of say they have to find the plume. Navigation up is pretty straightforward unless you lose it. And then there are various casting strategies. So we've run thousands and thousands and thousands of moths through these experiments. And uh, here's a way in which this thing is set up in a sense. You can see here that uh, when we can't keep expanding this area computationally forever, but what we do is we end up looping an animal back into this model if it gets to the edge. And we think this is a reasonable approximation. It's a fairly large area. And the model itself, as I said, is pretty straightforward. The details here are not terribly important other than when you're in the plume and you detect a reasonable concentration of odor, you head upwind. If you lose the plume, you cast. We'll explore what you do to cast. And there's, then you go back to the searching strategy, ranging strategy. And again, we can vary those parameters as well. So here's a little bit of experimental data from the wind tunnel showing casting behavior. Now you're looking down on the flight track of a moth heading up. Here's the wind going this way, pheromone sources over here, and here's the gypsy moth navigating along the plume. In all the other cases, we shut the pheromone source off at the point where this, these dots become a little bit thinner, and then you can see the casting behavior ensuing. And the casting behavior in the wind tunnel seems to be fairly defined into maybe a couple of meter at most, because 
partly because if they went any farther, they'd hit the wall of my wind tunnel. So we don't really know how that affects it. But field data suggests that the casting may be a little bit wider in the field, but not a lot. So let's look at casting strategies. We, we actually had a whole bunch that we looked at. Uh, and we have a sort of a three turns per second producing a very small cast, which you would expect to be ineffective perhaps, larger getting up to two meters, uh, final sweep followed by two four meter wide ones, and then a large final sweep by six meters. So the idea is of course for the moth to, the virtual moth to relocate the plume. Casting behaviors last for about 20 seconds, which pretty much matches what we saw in the wind tunnel. And uh, it's uh, fairly straightforward. These are just uh, some selected tracks. This is a very narrow cast. So here, this animal is flying along the plume. It loses it here. It regains it here. It, comes, it loses it. Then it goes into this casting behavior. And all of these, the strategy then is to go downwind. So that's the second part of that strategy. So here's a wide cast uh, and then downwind. So all of these things can be varied. And uh, casting is effective. Uh, the wide sweep seems most effective, but I'll show you a little data on that. But it, we don't really know that it's occurring that much in the field. For finding the plume, um, <clears throat> there are many strategies to use. Uh, they have these little lovely terms, uh, random walk, downwind based correlated random walk, crosswind bi bias, pardon me, correlated random walk, intermittent. The basic idea is that you uh, either uh, are going totally at random direction or the direction you take is dependent on the previous direction. You sort of vary somewhat. You don't sort of pick a random direction. And another strategy that people are very fond of considering is a leve walk. And this is a power law distribution, meaning that there are a lot of short distances interspersed with longer distances. So it sort of follows this kind of a distribution of the distance between turns. And this is very commonly uh, thought to occur in a whole variety of birds and, and other organisms foraging for resources. So when you see flight tracks here, you can sort of see that very idea. So over uh, on, <clears throat> on B, we have a levi walk where you have lots of short ones interspersed with longer ones. So the idea is that you end up sort of sampling an area fairly well, and then you move on a longer distance away to resample another area a little more carefully. And then these other ones here sort of uh, again, uh, carry you over greater, greater distances and sampling areas over that period of time. And the crosswind or downwind or upwind, of course, uh, is not probably very successful. So what you can see, I have a couple of slides here very quickly to sort of show you how these things pan out. So on the bottom is wind variability, meaning how many degrees per minute the direction is changing. So here it's not changing very much, it's 13 degrees. Here it's changing a lot, 65 degrees. And so this is the, um, this is the uh, finding the plume. And, and what you see is that the downwind correlated behavior doesn't do very well. Most of the others do pretty well. Um, and um, you know, the, the, the Levi walk does very well. So there, there's certainly a big difference in picking a strategy here if you're going to find a plume. And then this complicated slide sort of puts everything in one big perspective. It ties, tries to explain this from the viewpoint of uh, uh, the, the, the walk and whether you actually contact the plume in the virtual world, and then whether or not having contacted this plume you actually find the source, and then it plays it out at different distances from where you actually contact the source initially. And again, you can see some things don't work very well. The correlated uh, downwind walk uh, is very, very poor, but most of the others do fairly well. Uh, and uh, you can see that, uh, say, the Levi walk is actually one of the best performers here. 
uh, when the wind is shifting at 13 degrees, and it does fairly well again when it's shifting at 65 degrees. So we think we can understand how to program a virtual moth to find a virtual plume. Uh, it's going to be a little more difficult to sort of imagine how we're going to use that uh, in the field to understand the things. Uh, um, so very quickly, because I'm running into question time soon, and I stand between you and coffee, I don't want to do that. Uh, so here are the crosswind and downwind strategies are not highly effective strategies for finding a plume and location. Levi walk and other random walk permutations are all effective. Uh, and, and because of the way in which crosswind has got twice the area of upwind and downwind in terms of the angles, uh, it ends up being an effective system. So this is what we expect to find perhaps in nature. And we, can, uh, we have used this now to understand, uh, I don't show you these simulations, but one of the major uses and one of the reasons I work with pheromones is it's very useful in insect control, either for mating disruption, direct control, but also surveillance of invasive aliens. And uh, the real problem is understanding how many traps to put out in a landscape so that you don't uh, fail to detect an insect that's there. And so we are now using this method to sort of say how many, what are, the, what are the effective distances with traps? And we have some very, very good data from uh, re Mark Release Recaptured so that we can sort of make sure that this is a, a true uh, story at the end. And the last part is to sort of go back to something. We'll, we'll leave the air and go down into the water. Jay Farrell uh, and, and I did receive funding for our work uh, based not so much on uh, aerial plume following, but underwater plume following. And there's been a long history of this uh, in the Navy to look for, for example, unexploded ordnance. You might use divers, marine mammals, towing bodies. And now what they want to use is some of these submersibles. They sort of look like a torpedo. And they would launch these into the water, and they would uh, attempt to find a source. And what uh, you see here is fluorescein, which because we don't have, at, at the time these experiments were done, we didn't have any sensors that were capable of picking up, for example, unexploded ordnance and detecting it in the marine environment at the levels it would be found. So what they would use is fluorescein and use an optical detector to say whether or not this, the, we found the source of the pollutants, for example could be oil, it could be whatever was coming, and, and you had to find. So uh, Jay has published quite a bit on this, there, quite a bit on his website. I'll just show you one example of uh, his work in collaboration with the Navy. And uh, they ran these uh, out in San Diego Harbor. <clears throat> and what you see here are tracks. And these are the track is presumably starts here. And you find that there was detection of the odor, but then there was never any further detection of the odor, fluorescein in this case. Uh, this is a boundary that was uh, prescribed by the, uh, the Navy to search in. This is, this is, these are miles. This is not a small area. So it, it's, it's now searching in this area. and comes back. And here it picks up the odor plume, or the fluorescein, and it makes its way here. And eventually, it gets to this spot, and, and they have a little routine for saying the odor source is found. So this actually works. Obviously, this is not an optimotor reaction. So how did they do this? Well, they just used GPS. So the, the submarine, the little submersible, could keep track of where it was by GPS. But it's the same idea. Uh, now, you can program a lot more into that if you wish, because now you have that information. And getting back to infotaxis, you could program into that where you detected it and what the probability of finding it at some uh, other spot would be. So I think I'm more or less on time. I uh, thank you for your attention. And I hope I haven't gone through too much too quickly. Thanks.